Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar, and welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Dettol Banega Swast India at the Darbar Hall. We are delighted to introduce Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, a citizen-first approach with Rohini Nilakani in conversation with Veer Sangvi. This session is presented by Rajasthan Patrika. Author and philanthropist Rohini Nilakani presents selections from her speeches, columns, and opinion pieces in the path-breaking book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, a citizen-first approach. Based on her vast experience as a civil society leader, she believes that these three institutional pillars should function harmoniously with the mutual interests of national development. As the founder of Aghyam, a foundation for sustainable water and sanitation, and the co-founder of Pratham Books, a non-profit enabling access to books to all children, Nilekane combines both philosophy and praxis in an envisaging a better India. We're delighted to introduce her now. Rohini Nilikani is chairperson of Rohini, Rohini Nilikani Philanthropies and co-founder and director of Step, a non-profit educational platform. Her first book, Stillborn, was a medical thriller. She is also the author of 16 books for young children. Joining her is Veer Sangvi, who became editor of Bombay Magazine at 22, making him the youngest editor in the history of Indian journalism. His television career includes award-winning shows on the Star TV network, NDTV, and CNN TV 18. He also has a significant parallel career as India's lead food and travel writer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A uh, few declarations of interest before we start. Rohini and I have known each other since 1980. We worked together in, what, three magazines? Yeah, long before she was married, long before she became a word she hates, a millionaire. So I have seen the journey, I have seen the journey, I've seen the way it goes. So Rani, I'm going to ask you a bit about yourself, yeah? Is it fair to say, and I remember this myself, that you were born into the kind of family that didn't care that much about money, it was sort of family that prided education, culture over money, is that accurate? Yes, but first of all, let me say namaste to this marvelous Samaj of JLF. I feel very, very honored to be sitting here with you and thank you so much, Veer, for doing okay. this. Um, yeah, I was brought up like uh, in a very ordinary uh, middle class Mumbai family. I think the advantage, uh, as you would agree, being in Mumbai means you already had privileges because Mumbai is an amazing city in the, as I was growing up yeah. in the 60s, 70s. Uh, we had clean running water, yeah. we had safe public transport, we had electricity, we never knew blackouts. And this is not just the rich, it was peop ordinary people yeah. everywhere. So we were very lucky that even though we were middle class, we don't realize how much the benefit of good public infrastructure helped us to be very comfortable in our great yeah. educational institutions. But mainly in my family, definitely education was a priority, but there was this, um, there was this very idealized sense of simple living and high thinking yeah. because of my grandfather, especially being a Gandhian who joined the 1917 Champaran uh, time agitation to set up the first ashram in Biti Harva. And that was held as the highest ideal. Volunteering your time for society was held as the biggest ideal. So that's the kind of situation yeah. in which we grew up. Is it fair to say that when you met your husband and you married him, he was a young engineer, very brilliant, but by no means was it clear that he would become a billionaire? Oh yeah, absolutely not. I can give you pictures of Nandan in 1979. And uh, just what attracted me to him was his incredible brain. Yeah. He used to be called Mr. Brain or something at that. Yeah. And uh, just very down-to-earth, Hawaii chapels kind of person, but with a very fucking mind yeah. and a great sense of humor, two very important things to have in a life partner. Okay. okay, so now you get married, you move to Bangalore, your husband starts a company we've all heard of along with a few other co-founders and they need money. They don't have enough money to put in as an investment and you have a savings which is what, your little journalistic salary, whatever, and you empty your account and you buy shares in this new company in your own name. That's roughly correct? 
Yeah, well, they asked, uh, I was asked to put in some money. I had 10,000 rupees of my savings. <laughs> and uh, I must admit, 5,000 was given at, uh, by my parents. So okay. I technically, I had only 5,000 rupees of savings. 5,000 from my parents. And I put it into Infosys because we were young and we really didn't know anything better. We could take any risks in life. And uh, uh, yeah, put it, I didn't expect it to uh, sort of do so well. And then, of course, Infosys does well. It does better than anybody expected. And suddenly, your shares multiply, multiply, multiply. In the early part of the century, when Infosys is listed abroad, <clears throat> you make in the American depository the first lot of serious money, which is, I think, about 100 in crores. In the 90s, yeah. Yeah. yeah? It was in the, the 90s. 90s. 100 crores? Yeah, I first came into that 100 crores. And at that time, it seemed like a unbelievable sum of money that right. one could possibly Rony, not Rony, it, it still does to most of us. Sorry? Lot. It still does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to sound like, oh, poor yeah. little rich girl at all. Sorry. Yeah, okay. No, but that time it seemed like a billion, you know. It seemed like crazy. Why would you need that? But, you know, I knew Nandan and you during that period. And when the money came in, the thing that struck me was how you treated the money not as a reward for good investment, success, but almost as an obligation that you had to do something with it that was not just for yourself, that was for society. Is that fair? Yeah, no, Veer, I struggled with the idea, you know. Uh, in that time, India was very socialist in the thinking and we always thought, uh, even growing up in Bombay, we thought, Wealthy people meant some garbad was going on, okay? Yep. And then I suddenly find myself wealthy and I know there's no garbad going on. So I have to completely rethink and position yep. what I mean by what is wealth? What is the responsibility of wealth? It took me a few years, I struggled with it, but then I saw it. Why can't it be an opportunity to do what you claim to have wanted since your teenage, a better samaj, a better society that you could contribute to? So. That was the switch I made, and when we came into that money, I put it all into my foundation, Argyam, yeah. Yeah, you did, right? Yeah. So let's just go through your journey with uh, philanthropy. You started out by doing smallish projects that didn't necessarily work, right? Even before the big money came. So tell us about those. So started in 1992, exactly 30 years ago. At that time, just after a few, uh, couple of years after, a very dear friend had died in a needless car accident. And it really bothered me that how can all of us tolerate the lack of safety on Indian roads? And some of us got together, some well-meaning citizens in Bangalore, including Kiran Mazumda, Jagdish Raja and others, and said, let's do something about the safety of Bangalore's roads. There was a lot of goodwill and action, but it didn't amount to much. And actually, we should all worry about this because 150 to 160,000 people die on Indian roads every year. Yeah. Most are preventable deaths. But we didn't know how to do it, so it failed. But I learned very quickly that what was missing in Nagarik were probably the Nagariks, the citizens. <laughs> and that unless you include citizens, and they must feel the demand, they must feel part of the problem, they must want to be part of the solution, otherwise it won't work. But that was a huge lesson. And then later I was able to um, work in Akshara Foundation, Pratham Books, Argyam, Xstep, etc., etc. I remember talking to Nandan and you when all of this started. And both of you said, and it was a novel point of view, you said that We've made this money not because we're necessarily better than anybody else. It's because, as you said, I was lucky to have invested in a company that did so well. Nandan said he was lucky to be in a sector that was a go-ahead sector. He made it because of India. He made it because of society. And there was an obligation, therefore, to give back to society, to do more for society. That still remains your view. Oh, absolutely. I tell you, uh, no matter how brilliant anybody is in the world, Nothing can justify the kind of wealth that is being accumulated in the hands of very few. First of all, luck plays a huge role and social policy, economic policy, political policy plays a huge role in allowing the accumulation of wealth. And I'm sure many of us are concerned with the way this accumulation is happening. I believe that no society will tolerate for too long the accumulation of wealth in few private hands unless that wealth is used to create the better society for everybody. And so far, in India, uh, just in India, Indians are still very optimistic, I believe, that there is still opportunity for the young people of this country. And so they are tolerating some of this. But that's why the responsibility of wealth. I genuinely believe that wealth has to show 
People who are wealthy have to show that they're going to commit to create a more equal society. Otherwise, no society can tolerate, no government, no society can tolerate this for too long. You think so? I mean, just seems to be, forgive me for saying this, seems to be getting worse and worse in India. We have seen the emergence of our oligarchs, of people who control everything, often with political help. I mean, is it, yeah. and society seems happy tolerating it. But this is, this is why the book, right? This is why the work, this is why my book, Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar, and the premise of my book, for those of you, would, I would love some of you to read it and continue the conversation. The book is a invitation to continue the discourse on Samaj, why is Samaj the foundational sector? And unless Samaj picks up these issues in yeah. perpetual discourse, Power will accumulate in markets and the state. It yeah. will. That's the nature of power. But it's up to all of us as citizens to first see ourselves as citizens, not as consumers, not just as subjects of the state. When we do that, and I have hundreds of instances when I've seen that happen, I think that's when these questions get asked more, more sharply. Yeah. And no political establishment can ever resist a strong public demand. It's impossible. So it's up to all of us really to expand that discourse. Roini and I have discussed this often that, and her view is that yes, there are concerns about oligarchs, concerns about concentration of wealth, concerns about the way government seems to be helping certain individuals, not others. But she still believes that there is a perception in India among ordinary people that the route to wealth, the route to the top is not blocked off. Say in America, if you were to talk to people now, they're all very pessimistic about the future. But she believes that in India, there is still in our hearts optimism about the future, optimism about the country. This is a question Rohini asks always, so I'm going to ask it first. How many of you are optimistic about India of the future? Put your hands up. Okay. How many are pessimistic? Okay, you win the point again. <laughs> no, it's just so marvelous, you know. Of course, if you read the newspapers or if you're on social media, you can get pretty depressed. You can, yeah. uh, you know, feel miserable about the state of the world and humanity. But the minute you go outside and meet other people, most people are not busy polarizing each other in yeah. every conversation, right? We all want to make human connections and I really believe, and I hope all of you will support me that we've reached peak polarization and can only get better from here. And it's up to all of us, honestly. I really believe that with all my heart. So, so when, I, when I go out into the field, there are 90 organizations we are currently supporting and Nandans are separate. And when I go and meet young people, especially young people, we have a portfolio called Active Citizenship. I can name dozens of organizations like Reap Benefit, Civicus. They are trying to engage other young people to say, get involved in making your own society and your futures better. Who else is going to do it for you? See, we cannot sit back and hope to have good governance. You can't be consumers of good governance. You can be consumers of market products and services, but we can't be passive consumers of good governance. We have to co-create the good governance we all want. And I believe that no matter who you are and where you are, you have to, have to, have to participate. Even if it is in your own building, okay, to make sure that the lifts work or, you know, everybody has a voice in which paint should be put. I, it could be as small as that. Or your neighborhood park, or whether your street lights work, or whether your area is safe for women. Whether you can, whether you can get the vote out, whether you can ask your legislators. By the way, it's fine if most legislate, most people I found veer in the campaign that Nandan had when he ran unsuccessfully uh, for the MP in the Lok Sabha elections in um, two elections ago. Most people were very keen, naturally, because they feel helpless, hapless, hopeless. All of us sometimes feel so helpless against the system. They wanted the MP to fix their taps in the road outside their house. But what if instead they asked Nandan, if, you, if we vote for you, will you help create the better laws that will automatically allow the implementation of good governance? We forget that our legislators are lawmakers. Ask them, are our laws good enough to support a robust society, to support inclusion, justice, access. Sometimes if you look at some of our laws, 
we really need to think. You know, we don't think about it often because we, none of us expect to go to jail. At least I hope not. And, um, uh, you know, we these don't think. These days, nobody is sure, but still. <laughs> well, well, which is why, which is why all of us need to think about our justice system. Are our laws, good laws, I believe, create a good society. And all of us need to read the laws. We need to ask our legislators, many elections coming up, let's speak to our legislators about making laws better for all of us. Okay. Rohini has referred to the book, and I've read it, so I, I want to heartily recommend it. It's not a sort of preachy treatise, it's a collection of articles about the connection between society, the market, and government. And it's an, got an interesting perspective, but the overwhelming message, I think, is that society is how people organize themselves, and everything else, the market, the government, flows from the people, and yet people don't seem to realize that. Is that a fair summary? Yes, thank you. Because, you know, it's become, it's become so easy. As soon as I wake up in the morning, I bet like all of you, I pick up my phone. And it's so easy for us to just become consumers. Yeah. Passive consumers are what the state gives us. And today, today in our country, in many countries, the state is so powerful but so capable of delivering good services to us. Yeah. Which is a great thing. Today, more people in India are getting access to more public services than ever before. But we shouldn't allow that to dull us into just accepting things. I think remaining active. Because change is happening constantly. The biggest change we are going to face is climate change. And it's already upon us. So what are we going to do? The state can't solve for it alone. We have to solve for it together. Yeah. And so it's easy to be just a consumer. It's easy to be just the subject of a ben benef benefactor state. Yeah. But that's not going to solve the problems of the future for the generations to come. So that's why I feel that we have to see ourselves as Samaj first. After all, bazaar ke log, sarkar ke log aate se hai, samaj se hi to aate hai na? You can be a chief minister, okay, in the daytime, but when you go home, you're still a citizen. You can be a CEO, but when you go home, you're still a citizen. Yeah. And so the more we strengthen civil society institutions, the more we all see ourselves as citizens first, the, the pool from which government and bazaar people come out, will be better and better and better, right? So those who keep this idea that Samaj is the foundation, is the Neve, it's on top of that that Sarkar and Bazaar came centuries ago so that Samaj could be better because Samaj is not a monolith, right? We, how much we fight between ourselves. And that's why you need the state to establish the rule of law. Okay. And you need the markets to create value, to help us understand value of exchange, to help us get goods and services from pure innovation. We absolutely need the bazaar and the sarkar. But we must understand that it comes out that the bazaar and the sarkar are there to serve the samaj. We are not there to serve the bazaar and sarkar. The sarkar and the bazaar are there to serve we the people of India and we the people of the world. Let me tell you what many if not most people in the audience are thinking they're thinking this is great you are so so right but listen i'm at the mercy of my local mla i'm at the mercy of my local cop who doesn't even bother to do anything i'm at the mercy of people who create hatred between communities it's all very well to say it's up to me to seize the initiative but what can i do oh everybody can do something and i think we all know it deep inside our hearts so explain that sorry explain what we can do right so i mean Take anything, any issue, and I've seen many people do that, right? In your own, as I mentioned, your building association, since we are in Jaipur, there may be many resident welfare associations you can get involved with. I can guarantee you here in Rajasthan, there are thousands of NGOs that you can get involved with. Rajasthan is among the most amazing NGOs. Yep. And once you get involved with the smallest thing, you take back agency. You take back agency to not just be a recipient of some injustice or just a witness or a sufferer. You take back agency. You take back what is known as the locus of control to change something. And how many of you have taken part in some kind of small social change activity? There you go. Have you yes. felt empowered by doing so? 
Yes, as soon as we get involved, we realize that things are more solvable than we thought. We are all in this human story together, right? We are so dependent on each other. And we saw that so much in the pandemic. I'm not just saying this. I'm not some, uh, what is it, some idealistic person who doesn't understand reality. Going across India with some of the marvelous institutions that we support, we realize there is enough space for hope, optimism, and really coming together to solve the bigger challenges between us. But we have to commit ourselves to it. It's not going to happen automatically. Doesn't matter what is the smallest thing each of you can do. I swear it'll be the best and most interesting journey of your life if you haven't already embarked on it. So any problem, uh, uh, Veer, Legislators actually are desperate for us to, uh, all our lawmakers, the panchayat people, the municipality or uh, bureaucrats. I have met hundreds of bureaucrats who are so happy once they understand the power of our intent, that we are not mm. there for the wrong reasons. They are so happy to collaborate. Everybody can create access, but there's one thing. It's much harder for individuals to do it. It's very hard for an yeah. individual to just walk into a government office or somewhere and say, I demand my rights or I want to help you. But collective action, collective action, going as a group of like-minded people with the right intent, it is impossible to stop that in society. It is impossible to stop a few good people doing something right. I have experienced it a thousand times. How many of you are members of any NGO, any group that organizes, does things? Yeah, so about, about 20 percent, 25 percent. Yeah. You think the figure should be what? Ideally, 100 percent. Well, it, you need not even be. You know, many of you may have just clicked on change.org. I'm sure many of you have felt, oh, I care about this cause. How many of you care about something in society? It could be anything at all, right? Almost everybody. I don't need yours today. I don't. Need, some. All of us want to change something in the world. Well, honestly, India is one of the places in the world today where you really can do that. And it is going to be the Samaj of India, starting from the Samaj of JLF, which is so <laughs> alert and aware, that is going to create the change that we all want. India is ripe for positive change, but not if we don't create it, not without that, impossible. But we can, and I think we should. Okay, the bit I think people are slightly skeptical about is your claim that when you went around India, you spoke to bureaucrats and politicians and they welcomed the initiative. I think most people would argue that politicians are happy to get elected. After that, they lose interest in Samaj and in people and get on with their lives. What you're saying is counterintuitive. No, I'm very sorry. Of course, there will be some politicians that uh, get elected and forget us. Yeah. But I have met many politicians and I urge all of you to meet your local politicians. What my experience of politi politicians has been, and especially during the campaign, we underestimate just how hard they work. They may not work as strategically as we want them to. That's partly because we don't let them. The demands we make on our politicians in India is relentless. It's a 24 by 7 job where somebody or the other wants something for you every minute. Okay? It could be, and because we have such an identity based demand system. Yeah. Every group wants something out of the politician and it's very hard for the politician to juggle that. So while I'm not saying all politicians are trying their best for us, I have seen many of them really struggling to do so. And we have to find if we want our democracy to thrive, if we want our democracy to really um, survive some of the onslaughts that democracies are having worldwide today, then we as citizens need to get more engaged with the people whom we are going to vote in, or even the people who want us to vote them in. And just understand how we can be better voters, how we can be better constituents, so that they can be better politicians. I have seen really hardworking politicians and the system, we have to help change the political system for the better. Okay, let me ask, how many of you have dealt with an MP, your MLA, and asked for changes? Okay. Yeah, so do you think not enough of us do that? It's, it's very few of us because we feel there's so much distance between us and this politician, yeah. right? There's so much distance. So that's why supporting intermediary organizations that can make your voice heard, like your RWA, it could be other, your civil society organizations that are 
putting pressure on the politician to deliver back for society. I think just a little bit rethinking that as citizens, how if we change something, not asking you to put five hours a day, nobody can do that, but an hour a week to just think through all these things collectively together. Let's just begin by opening the discourse at the dinner table. Everybody switch off your iPads and mobiles, talk to each other about how do we foster a better democracy. I think it'll be fun. There'll be some good fights at the table that always are nowadays, but at the end of it, if we can have a more awakened citizenry that is willing to participate in keeping our democracy alive, at least that's what makes me optimistic about young people. Okay. One of your observations is that people are optimistic, yet as we've seen, people feel distanced from the political system. Your prescription is yes, as an individual you may well feel distanced, and it's probably in the interest of people around the MP or the minister to keep you distant. But once you organize, once you're part of an organization, it's much more difficult for them to ignore you. Yeah, it is hard especially when they can see that the cause is just and the intent is right. I have not seen a politician or a bureaucrat being able to resist that. They will yeah. engage. Now, everything doesn't work all the time. With government, when we have worked with government on policy change, you take two steps forward, you do take one step back. Yeah. But nobody can resist, as I said before, nobody can resist the power of a few good people coming together to ask for positive change, not just for themselves, but for others as well. It's not possible to resist that. Okay. And, and you may not succeed the first time, but we can't afford to give up. We can't afford to give up. Otherwise what? Otherwise what will happen if all of us don't participate? We have 1.4 billion people whose destinies are tied to each one of us. Yeah. So we have to. Okay, let me give you another view, which is that we shouldn't have to do this. Politicians should be doing this for us anyway. We elect these guys, we have expectations of them. Why should we figure out ways of getting to them, whatever? So is what you're suggesting an alternative to a failing political system, which is not responsive to the needs of people? The Sarkar can never respond to everything that every citizen wants. It's impossible. At hmm. the People call it the last mile. We prefer to call it the first mile, okay? For the state to reach the first mile where the vulnerable citizens especially yeah. are, or where civic failures are happening is very hard. Which is why I believe in a thriving civil society that acts as an intermediary to represent the interests of that, the people at the first mile. And I really believe that we need to support that civil society, to support the institutions. Today, there's a lot of distrust. Hey, NGO, what do they do? Who knows? The Who knows? Who knows what the big business people are doing? So there's been a dissolving of some trust between us and all the institutions. Yeah. But we have to get involved. We have to create bridges across our differences, which basically means without too much judgment, can we create safe spaces in the Samaj to talk to each other? That is the first thing. Then can we collectively organize? Now we've seen this in so many, Rajasthan mein hum hai. In Rajasthan for centuries, okay, people have worked together, Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar, to conserve every drop of water. Only, in some places, only 150 mm falls in one shower in this state and they make it last for the whole year. Without Samaj being involved, this is impossible. Whereas I've seen in other places, Cherapunji is getting less rainfall. Places in Bihar where rain is falling on their heads and they're not able to conserve water. So sometimes making sure that you're able to turn a crisis into an opportunity requires the innovation of the Samaj. And God knows we have n number of crises today to turn into opportunities. Yes, that's, there's no shortage of those. Let's talk a bit about philanthropy. I think many people don't understand the difference between philanthropy and charity. Yeah, we all need charity because we are human to human. We have to understand if somebody is suffering in front of me, can I lend out a hand? That is good old charity. That is the real meaning of phil philanthropy also, the love of humankind. All of us reached out in the pandemic to those who are less fortunate than us. And actually in India, we much more than even the richie richies gave. More than 350 crores was collected from ordinary people across the country to help those who are suffering in the pandemic. And retail giving in India is very much alive. So that is really a fantastic thing. But so that's the kind of charity that we all need to do. And Indians do it extremely well. 
But philanthropy, when you come into a lot of money, how are you going to use that money to create strategic change? How can you work at a systems level? How can you work to change policy which impacts millions of people? That more strategic yeah. investment in systemic change is hopefully where philanthropy is headed. At least that's what we try to do through XTEP Foundation and okay. other efforts. One view, and my view, is that Indian industry, forget about the Tatas and what Jamshedji did centuries ago, is okay with charity. There's no shortage of guys building temples or whatever. But we haven't really understood philanthropy. Is that a fair observation? I think Indian philanthropy is at a very exciting stage right now. Especially young That's people. not an answer. Sorry? That's not an answer. <laughs> so, so I'm telling you why. Okay, uh, so you're agreeing with the point. Uh, I'm saying that the Tatas, the Birlas, and many, many Parsi families, yeah. many Parsi families actually in, in Mumbai, etc., would build public infrastructure right. very quietly, didn't even have their names on the bridges. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of very strategic work. But this was, this was a while ago, to be Sorry? fair. This, this was a while. Last century. Yeah. Last century. <laughs> no, even the century before that. <laughs> but, um, but I would say post-91. Yeah. By about 2000, our, even our wealthy uh, industrial families yeah. had become a little more comfortable that their wealth will not be snatched away in taxes or through bad, yeah. comp bad competition. So they started to give back more. And the younger generation of wealth, uh, uh, wealthy yeah. people yeah. who became, they don't even remember the age before globalization and liberalization, okay? So they have a different kind of attachment to money. Money comes, money goes. Yeah. And uh, they, they, they kind of have a, they feel that even if they lose money, so they are more willing to take more risk in philanthropy yep. than our old industrial families who needed to pass it down from generation to generation. And we're scared they would lose Bangalore, it. in Bangalore, I see our tech entrepreneurs like uh, Nitin Kamath has committed hundred million dollars to climate change. Now, who knows what his net worth will be? Mr. Sam B Bankman Fried can tell you the story yeah, or right. two like that. Yeah. But still, they are more ready to commit. Yeah. So here's my question. You talk about 91 being a watershed, which of course it was for India, but a lot of the wealth that's been created post-1991 has been created from people outside the traditional, I don't want to use the word banya, outside the traditional merchant class. These are professionals, young people, people from middle class backgrounds whose parents were not entrepreneurs. Do you think their attitudes are different? I really think so because for whatever reason, and I don't want to make this a critique of some license Raj or crony capitalism, though yep. there is that critique and it's in there out in the domain. But opportunities became more flat, yep. right? More people with few investments, access to bank loans, access to brilliant ideas, access to global thinking and capital were able to exercise their innovation in an economy that was willing to uh, encourage it. And yep. so you got this whole new breed of uh, middle class and upper middle class and wealthy people. Yeah. So there's a whole different narrative to wealth creation now. And I hope it sustains because in the world of technology, and this is why, you know, we have to think in the digital technology world, you can have a winner takes all situation yeah. arising. But again, for that, I really feel, as I say in the book, that just like we've had a physical civil society, we need a digital civil society to spring up so that we can keep tabs and create the checks and balances in the technology domain, in the digital age that is already upon us. But okay. otherwise, yes, I do think there is a broadening of opportunity for innovation. Like Nandan keeps saying earlier, just a few years ago, there were just 15,000, 16,000 uh, startups. Today, there are almost one lakh. In such a short period, people are brimming with ideas. Yeah. Where I live in Koramangla, you bump into entrepreneurs literally every three steps of the way. Okay, we've asked questions of the audience. I'm going to ask you some questions. If the answer is yes, put your hand up. Are you optimistic about India? Yes, I am. Hand up. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. Hand yeah. up. Are you more optimistic now than you were, say, 10 years ago? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that the future is going to be better because of the young people in this audience? Thousand percent. All right. Because of the young people. And it's not a burden on you, okay? It's, it's, it's a joyful responsibility. So ultimately, we've left behind many years of varied experiences. But the reason for your optimism is that 
the young people are more idealistic the new generation of entrepreneurs are more idealistic and much more than that we've seen particularly with the organ of the 100 organizations you support that when people come together and they make demands for what things that should be their rights things do change yeah i think young people do want to create a better society for themselves yeah. they can see the possibilities if they don't participate things can go very wrong i am not saying things there are not bad winds that we will confront but i think because india is so young we have a 30 40 year window uh, to turn those crises into opportunities and um, i didn't use the word democratic dividend yeah. i i think i don't want to be glib about it but i think people do care about freedoms i think there is a ongoing worldwide debate and divide about individual freedoms and public order and i think because we are so young indians are quite hyper libertarian they say why should i drive on only one yeah. side of the yeah, road true. i mean <laughs> honestly why yeah we so, don't like rules so we like our freedoms we like our, and i think yeah. we will fight for those liberties and uh, so long as we can collectively do that um, and collectively push for a better common future not just for ourselves india is more i think better placed i just came back from davos where you know we also heard there about how eventually people in ukraine people in afghanistan people in iran are fighting for their freedoms because when you get to lose your freedoms yeah. you realize they are more precious than every diamond and piece of gold you can yeah. find on this planet so i feel that our indian people have desire and will nurture freedom okay that's a nice optimistic note to end this part of the session <laughs> let me now throw this open uh and try and get people from all over we have about 15 minutes less actually 13 minutes so make your question short quick sharp questions if you make a speech i will be rude and shut you down the lady over there yeah hi rohini thanks for this um, love your optimism and you just talked about freedom so i just wanted to bring up two other areas uh, india has been slipping um press index press freedoms uh, we've been slipping in every index on human rights how important are these and uh, what would your foundation maybe do about them so i want all of us i want all of us to think about our own see for example i have a portfolio called access to justice okay because there are so many people working on this i care about systemic change every government wants to accumulate power all over the world from everywhere is again that's why i go back to samaj 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 it is what we do how will we protect our freedoms you know how can all of us say bail not jail how can we care about things like that and today there is in rajasthan for example a marvelous thing called open prisons there are 42 open prisons in rajasthan can there be such things all over the country there is there are uh, organizations like vidhi that is trying to say that if we can create better laws and better standards for better laws it will be much harder to have arbitrary decisions that will allow some people to be imprisoned or not if we can all get involved in this i believe there is no other <coughs> way out human rights are very critical who would like to be locked up who would like our rights taken away of course we don't want that we all want our freedoms especially for our children and the younger generations but it's not something that we can just forget about it's not something that we can leave to others and i believe it starts a lot with the legal and jurisprudence framework that we should get involved in that's some of the work that we do through my foundation okay question from there can you please stand when you do the question we want to catch you on camera yeah hello ma'am you don't want to be caught on camera but yeah hello ma'am as a student of civil service I want to ask that if in the case of politician or a bureaucrat desires to make a change in the society but does not able to do, do the same because of the superstitious traditions and culture present in the hinterlands or the villages of India, how can he or she will deal with the, these those problems? You mean? Did you say superstition? Yeah. 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 yeah well, India is a country. where so many centuries there are people occupying many centuries and 
But I think the arc of the future is towards more rationality all over the world. It's not towards more superstition. And of course, some people value their superstitions. And we ha change happens very slowly in societies. Sometimes it happens rapidly. But we have to allow, say today's diffusion of technology can sometimes create rapid change in a culture. Who would have thought 700 million people would wear some mask on their face all the time, right? We can change positively quickly. And that's why I believe the moral leadership in a society matters. But I think the arc is bending away from superstition. Not as fast as some people want, but I believe younger people care more about science and rationality. Okay, that's fine. Let me get somebody from the back. There's a lady who keeps waving. Yeah, can you give her a microphone, please? Eh? Hi. Thanks, Roni. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm an animal activist. You speak a lot about human I rights. I don't know where the person is. Oh, uh, right here. Oh, Easiest okay. to find, yeah? <laughs> okay. Standing there. Um, it's very important also for civil society to come together for um, the animals and the birds and the forests and we don't see that happening in India. There's no national movement for animal rights. It's individual organizations working for it. How do we rally, maybe the public in here, to come together and let the Sarkar know that we will vote if you change animals for animals. Menka Gandhi has been sitting there for so long in the parliament and the laws haven't really changed. It's still 50 rupees if you kill an animal. How do we get these MPs to listen? It's not that we haven't tried. Yeah. We've, so how do we do that for animals and for the environment as such? I think you got your answer from this wonderful audience because of their claps. Yeah. Yes, more of us need to see the connection between us and the animal world. At least I'm a total nature enthusiast and disappear into the forest every minute I can get. But uh, how can we integrate urban and rural and forest. How can we bring more of nature into our urban settlements is something I care about. Because once you see that next to you, and it's not wildlife and animals are not something that's far away from us, then I think, and honestly in India, have you seen the compassion towards street dogs to the point where other people are saying enough compassion? So I think people care. Have you seen the compassion towards cows? Have you seen the compassion towards goats? I think essentially, this is one country, and I'm so proud of this, and I hope it doesn't change. This is the one country in the world with a maximum population pressure, right? In our country, 1.4 billion people in a country one third the size of America and the highest biodiversity of flora and fauna. That doesn't happen unless human beings have compassion for the natural world. We can't afford to lose it. Okay, let's go to a section of the audience I haven't been to before. At the back of this side, anybody has a question? Yeah, there's somebody there with a hand up. Can you give the gentleman a microphone, please? He's right at the end, so you may have to trek across here. He's standing at the... This was actually not who I had in mind, but go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, sir. Madam, don't you think that uh, more and more talented uh, children and uh, people are going abroad to uh, search more better field than India? And uh, say in China, they are, they are um, uh, bound to come back after doing in America and England good things and then serve the nation. How we can deal with this. Thank well, you. Uh, thank you. But actually, uh, the numbers are not that high. Remember the base that of population that we are talking about and the base of students is 360 million in this country. We just have to create more opportunity for them to stay. But I am okay with them going uh, abroad to study or whatever. 12 multinational corporations are headed by India, CEOs of Indian origin and the amount they want to give back to India. So I think in that sense, both work. So yeah. it's where the opportunity is. Also, can you really, if you talk about freedom, can you really stop people from going abroad? I think, you know, sometimes governments try to stop people. It never works. Sometimes people, governments try to stop capital. So long as we can keep knowledge flowing across borders, we are still in a good place. Yeah. The best way to cope with a brain drain is to create more brain, no? Yes, Which is absolutely. what we're doing at the moment. And you should see the energy of young people yeah. 
today. Even when they don't have access to good colleges, they are on a self-learning path. Absolutely. And some of India's digital public infrastructure, which I really believe is going to create more economic democracy, we need to understand that. And from economic democracy, more social and political democracy can emerge over time. We are setting the rails for economic democracy. And that includes creating the ability for 100 million young people to be on the track of self-learning and learnability. Absolutely. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, you, you point out and I'll move. Okay. Should I go ahead with the question? Hang on. There was somebody you had said had no. submitted a question earlier. We're okay with that? Yeah. All right. Sorry, who's got the microphone now? You tell us. You so, no, tell somebody uh, is. Somebody's... Yeah, there, sir. Where? Where are you? <laughs> I have a question here, sir. Okay, all right. You've yeah. got the microphone finally. Okay, fine. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So, uh, pleasure uh, listening to you today, ma'am. We have been working with Infosys Foundation on grassroots level programs. So, my question is more on the Samaj aspect of the situation. Uh, we spoke about safe discussion places. Yes. While the youth is up and coming and full of energy. Yes. Off late, we have seen a trend in adults where the adults are becoming polarizing. Yeah. And they are believing in every WhatsApp forward, believing yeah. in fake news. Uh, pushing their uh, 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 oppressing views on the youth and creating that polarization in the society. How we bring the safe discussion spaces with adults and hence in the families. If you can't do it with adults, do it with your peers. But tell me, who Kisine Hamko force kiya hai ki to listen and participate in the polarization? No. I think it's time to restrain ourselves from unnecessarily polarizing and hateful comments. It, first of all, the person who's making the hateful comments, unke help is sabse jyada asar padta hai. I'm convinced of that. Or bus, 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 sabhi time a gaya hai. There's much work to do. We have so much more of India to build out. Let's get more positive. And I think young people, I'm telling you this, it's not about you asking me questions. I'm not some oracle. I'm not a founder at all. I come to you as a citizen and an erstwhile journalist. But I say to you, continue this conversation with your groups in your families. Samaj kaisa hona chahiye? Kaisa samaj hona chahiye? Jiske aadhar par acha sarkar aur acha bazaar banega. It's up to us. Can we invert the responsibility? Okay. This, at, at the root of his question is a fear, which is that we talk about samaj and how Samaj can hold politicians accountable if it organizes itself. The obvious counter to that is, unfortunately, all too often, politicians manage to divide Samaj along communal lines. They manage to polarize it. How can Samaj fight that? But that is precisely what I'm saying. Is it not up to us? Are we sheep? We are not sheep. Politicians know that we are not sheep, okay? I would say, think, think. The more hatred, the more division there is in societies, the less development there will be. What do we want for our children? What do we want for our children? We want abundance and prosperity for all. And we need to keep in mind climate change is coming. And climate change is not, pandemics and climate change don't decide ki tum left politics mein ho, right politics mein ho, beach wale politics mein ho, is caste ke ho, us religion ke ho. The che crises coming at us don't care about the color of our society and the color of our skin. What can we do? Okay? Politicians, unka dharm palenge. There is a dharma to politics yeah. because they have to get votes, okay? Power is a zero sum game. Electoral power. If you win more votes, I get you less lose. votes. Yeah. But in Samaj, it is not like that. In Samaj, if you get more power and give me less power, that doesn't create a better society. I have to try and e something will come up yeah. to equalize power in a society. Okay, I think we've got, there's a gentleman there who's had his hand up from the beginning. The gentleman who's waving, can we give him a microphone there? Sir, sir, we're finally giving you a microphone, yeah. Uh, uh, quick question on education, ma'am, building on what this yeah. is. A class five student, 40% of them cannot read a class three book. Yes. This is our reality right now. The Samaj, because of its discrimination, casteism, and of course economic stratification has denied good education to yes. a mass of people. Yes. The Sarkar has not managed to provide quality education so far. And, and the Bazaar is not interested because it does not have strong profit lines. What is 
the roadmap that we can have for direct intervention by business to provide quality education at the grassroots levels in India, I where we are losing competitive advantage. I think business is playing its role. The private schools are doing a good job. But, but I'll tell you, I've been working on education for nearly 30 years. I have never felt more sure that we're going to achieve the goals of universal, our desire for universal education outcomes. Successive governments, it's not this government or that. Every government has tried its best. We made some mistakes in the early late 40s and early 50s by not focusing on primary education. And the, in hindsight, it's easy to say. But today, that focus is very, very, very sharp. I believe in some of the work we are doing with 100 organizations across India in education. In three to five years, Nipun Bharat has been announced. The new education policy has been announced. The national curriculum framework for foundational learning is out there. It is pragmatic. It is wise. It is, um, it is backed by public funds. This is the best opportunity in the next, because it's the first fully literate generation in India. Think about that. There are now parents are literate for the first time since independence. All parents are literate and they can participate in the educational journey, the learning journey of their children as never before. Again, as Samaj, everyone has a role to play. Please play it. There's plenty of work to do in education. So, Akshara Foundation, I mean, I'm not with that anymore. I tend to move on from the All right, institutions. Yeah. You, do but you can look it up on the website. Okay. okay, before we end, because the buzzer is started, the lady standing menacingly over there. Just a final question. How many of you, having listened to Rohini, are still optimistic about India in the future? Well, tough, yeah. Okay, you've really, you've really changed minds. People are optimistic. How many of you believe it will help now if you organize and you join, join a societal organization rather than do things on yourself. Okay. More than before, but not quite enough. All right. Uh, not enough, but a big hand for the brilliant and sparkling Rohini Nilekani. And... हम सब समाज है, ओके? समाज का बदलाव सिर्फ हम ला सकते हैं। धन्यवाद और नमस्कार। And on behalf of everyone in this audience, thank you for what you do. Thank you for all the money you've given away. Thank you for not being selfish. Thank you for caring about India. We could do with more people like you. And with that, we would like to thank Rohini Lelekani and Veer Sangvi for this riveting session. We also thank Rajasthan Patrika for their support. There